In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. John Chrysostom writes, quote, Love is stronger than any wall. Love is firmer than any adamant. Or if you can name any material stronger than this, the firmness of love transcends them all. And of the first virtue of love, which St. Paul writes about, namely long-suffering or patience, St. John Chrysostom again writes, quote, Of a truth, there is nothing so impenetrable as long-suffering. You may talk of armies, money, horses, walls, arms, or anything else whatsoever. You will name nothing like long-suffering. For he that is encompassed by those, armies and money, horses, and so forth, oftentimes being overcome by anger, is upset like a worthless child and fills all with confusion and tempest. But this man, that is the long-suffering man, settled as it were in a harbor, enjoys a profound calm. Though thou surround him with loss, you have not moved the rock. Though thou bring insult upon him, you have not shaken <coughs> the tower. And though thou bruise him with stripes, you have not wounded the adamant. Now, in reflection upon those really wonderful uh, expositions of St. Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 13. It is woeful, dear Christians, that love's, love and love's virtues are little considered in our own time, even in the Holy Christian Church. Or worse yet, when they are considered, they are derided because of the abuse of love and its virtues by the world and those who efface what God's word here commends to us through St. Paul. True to his own character, the devil takes this love, which is to show forth to the world where the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ can be found, and he makes love's abuse the chief endeavor of our enemies. People taking up that which encapsulates the holy Christian church and the gospel in one word and using it for wickedness. And of course, those who desire to conserve or guard the good deposit of faith as we are commended and commanded in the word of God to do, so often are reactionary that we overcorrect against the abuse of those things which are properly our own. Seeking to show that love is not the acceptance of degeneracy, we drive into the ditch of bombacity, or we drive into the ditch of arrogance, derisiveness, and many other things, all in the name of defending what is true. Now, the issue at hand, of course, is that love, as St. Paul says, does rejoice together with the truth. It does not rejoice together with unrighteousness. But when love rejoices together with the truth, it does so according to love's character, which holds many things in tension, tempering everything with love on every side. Love, you must understand, is one thing. But it is also multifaceted. If one virtue of love, as laid forth by the blessed apostle St. Paul, is missing, it is liable to lead to an imbalance, and thereafter an erosion of love. Here is one example, again, from John Chrysostom. After praising long-suffering, he notes the next quality of love is kindness, and so he writes, quote, But Paul does not stop here, but adds also the other high achievements of love, saying, It is kind. For since there are some who practice their long-suffering with a view not to their own self-denial, but rather to the punishment of those who have provoked them, to make them burst with wrath, he says that neither has charity this defect. Wherefore also he added, Love is kind. For not at all with a view to light up the fire in those who are inflamed by anger do they deal more gently with them, but in order to appease and extinguish anger, and not only by enduring nobly, but also by soothing and comforting do they cure the sore and heal the wound of passion. You see very often how the devil and our own flesh seek to get the advantage. To use another obvious example, if humility is not tempered by love and more humility, one will boast in how humble they are. 
and in such way that they don't even recognize the contradiction they found themselves in of boasting of humility. So again, love is indeed one thing. We might say that love is a mosaic of various qualities, as Paul has listed them, which when held together in the proper way, show forth love. Love, then again, is long-suffering. Love is patient. But lest I want my long-suffering simply to enrage my enemy by giving them the silent treatment or something like this, love is also kind. And lest my own kindness leaves me disadvantaged or becomes uh, a point of pride, love does not envy or boast, nor is it arrogant or rude. And it does not allow me to insist on my own way, as though when I formulate a thought and express it, I mistakenly think uh, that my own way is the way that it is. And thereafter, less than yielding when appropriate, I become frustrated that I didn't get my way. St. Paul says that love is not irritable, that it is not resentful. And lest my yielding give room for unrighteousness to breathe, I'm reminded that love does not rejoice together with wickedness, but rather with the truth. And yet again, lest I become arrogant because God has graciously imparted to me faith that rejoices in the truth and allow my sinful flesh to express the truth as a noisy, unintelligible gong, then we are reminded that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. In this regard, I do grow increasingly concerned that many who desire to defend the truth of our confession and of our historic practice do so in such a way that love's rejoicing in the truth becomes the sole emphasis, and as a consequence, the other virtues of love are neglected. This is sort of a ridiculous example that I even have to bring up, but it's the best one I know of. I say it's ridiculous because it exists on social media. Many of you have probably been spared of this and God be praised for that. But one such example I encounter regularly is what might be called bro culture that's growing up in Christianity. I was in a Facebook group called Based Lutheran Fellowship, which I was reluctant to join because based is Zoomer speak, and I have nothing against them. I just have things against generational lingo. It kind of irritates me no matter where it's coming from. But in any case, it's Zoomer speak, and if something is based, it is deemed a good and an excellent thing. Now, one question that was raised in this group was a survey to all to answer, quote, is your church fully based? or does it have cringy elements? Now, what was the consequence of such a survey? Well, it was frankly a bunch of derisive discontent and a dredging up of complaints against various local congregations and their pastors. To me, this is shameful. In my view, it would amount to a bunch of people dragging out the sins of their own mothers and exposing their nakedness and shame like ham. It's behavior of worthless children, to use Chrysostom's phrase. And so it is that the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians that if one fails to hold the multifaceted qualities of love in the proper order and tension, he indeed thinks like a child. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. A child, for immaturity's sake, is often driven to extremes. But love, though it be strong indeed, is not given to extremes. Now it isn't to say, of course, that there aren't real problems in local congregations. There certainly are. Even as it was shameful for Noah to get drunk and end up naked in his tent, but Ham didn't have to expose it to his brothers. It is true that there are problems in families and amongst congregants or whatever else, but love deals with these things in an ordered way. Love desires to gain the brother rather than hang all his complaints about his brother out on a public clothesline for everyone to see and to make fun of and vaunt over. It seems to me that a love for what is true to the neglect of long-suffering and kindness leads to irritability. It leads to resentment. It leads to envy and to arrogance. And so Luther instructs us, quote, learn to calm your wrath and to have a patient, gentle heart 
especially toward those who give us cause to be angry, namely our enemies. And you might say, physician, heal thyself, because Luther uh, didn't seem to do this all that well. And he probably would have said, amen. I do it imperfectly. It's not as though these parts of Luther are always to be imitated. And we must need to think of these things, because we encounter people like this in our own synod on the regular. And what to do? I mean, I do get very frustrated when I encounter it in other pastors, going astray from our confession, going astray from the word of God. And I just want to pound them. Because I hate when faith is eroded away. I hate when we give up our confession for bells and whistles, thinking that we'll appeal to the world and bring many more in. Speaking ill of our fathers, that really does frustrate me. But when I encounter one such as these, and I do, I have to sort of restrain myself. Because I want to gain them. I don't actually want to destroy them. I want to gain them to what is true. So that they might love what is right and good, true and beautiful. As opposed to going the way of the world. As opposed to adopting the modus operandi of another culture. Namely the boomer culture that wants to degrade the beauty of the church. That does frustrate me. But I must needs be long-suffering and kind and try to gain my brother. Rebuke where it's necessary, when the time calls for it, but not every time I turn around. Otherwise, I have no hope of gaining him, but only hardening him and galvanizing him in his own position, in his own opinion. And so again, it isn't to say that these problems don't exist, don't hear me incorrectly, but it's a matter of how we respond. As those who have been blessed with a parish as we have, as those who have been blessed to hold the right and good confession, how do we use it in such way as to gain the brother and snatch him from the flames? Because it is equally true that we see the abuse of long-suffering and kindness which is not tempered by the love of the truth. And when people prefer long-suffering and kindness, this leads to an imbalance in the very same things that we complain about going on in the church. When long-suffering and kindness turn into toleration of the intolerable or promotion of what is unrighteous and departs from our historic faith and practice, we're in a sorry state. And so we find people insisting, as Paul says, not... Uh, on the way of our Lord Jesus Christ, but on their own way. That does happen. The balance, then, is hard to get right. In the event that the balance is struck appropriately, it is ordinarily derided by those who do not know what Paul calls a more excellent way. And this, dear Christians, we see embodied and incarnated in the Son of God, who was sent forth from the love of the Father and by love, he willingly subjected himself to open shame, to derision, to suffering and death. In other words, St. Paul's description of love is the shape of our Lord's life, even as we anticipate the end of its earthly trajectory, looking toward the season of Lent and Holy Week. And so our Lord says in the Holy Gospel appointed for today, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. In this, the sacred scripture declares is love. That Christ laid down his life for our sake. And so it is that mankind sees the perfect embodiment of love in the Son of God. Come down in the flesh. And the sinful flesh either doesn't understand, as we heard of the apostles, or it seeks to put these things to death. And yet in putting Christ to death, we see the perfect fulfillment of a well-balanced love. For there is none greater than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Now the formula of Concord says that the most severe preaching of the law is the crucified Christ, because it shows what our sin caused. Another way to say this is that the most severe preaching of the law is to extol love and its virtues. Because when we hear what love is, how woefully we reflect do we pursue love's true nature, expression, and virtues. 
Love indeed is strong as a fortress, and it is as hard as adamant. And so we must admit that falling short of the glory of God, we are also shattered by the demands of love. So indeed, the whole life of the Christian, following from and making use of our baptism, is to be one of repentance. Because the way of love, we often do not know. Or we know it in part and not fully, and so we stagger this way and that. But as much as this standard is strong and hard, and indeed it is, turned toward us in Christ Jesus, love is also gracious. And it forgives a multitude of sins. For Christ was indeed long-suffering in his passion. And he continues in the same way as we regularly go astray. He does this in kindness, not desiring his patience to cause us anger, but rather thanksgiving, knowing that even as it waited on us to be incorporated into his holy body, so it waits on many more to the same end. Our Lord does not envy, for all things are his. He does not boast because he does the will of his Father and there is nothing higher than this. He is not arrogant or rude, but compassionate and desirous that all come to the Father. He does not insist on his own way, but he goes forth willingly, drinking the cup appointed to him by his Father, and if willingly, then without irritation or resentment. And finally, our Lord rejoiced overly much in the truth that God promised to redeem the world. And to such an extent that he made use of the unrighteous hands of sinful men and forgave even these by his atoning death. He bore all. He believed all. He hoped all. He endured all. Christ Jesus loved. And he loves and is love. And as a consequence, he then forgives the sins of the world. He forgives you your sins. He sets you free of those vices that militate against love and love's virtue. And he strengthens the same by his true body and his precious blood, which he freely gives and he will soon give. So taste of the Lord, dear Christians, and love one another. To Christ be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.